Hi, I want to talk to you about something called a context-sensitive language, which is a generalization of context-free languages. So in a context-free language, so a CFL, those correspond to context-free grammars and PDAs and so forth. And so in the context-free grammar world, whenever we have some variable, we can replace it with some stuff. So this a right here, that is a variable, and the x over here is can be any mix of terminals and variables, any number that you wish in any order that you wish. So it's called a context-free grammar, the f stands for free, because if we have some derivation that involves the a at some point, then applying this rule is going to have exactly the same stuff on either side of the a, and then we, let's just say we replace it with whatever the x meant, then what we're going to get is exactly the same stuff on both sides, except this one location is changed. So the things that are immediately to the left or to the right of this a can be anything that you wish. But sometimes it may be useful to only allow ourselves to make this rule application happen if A is surrounded by certain things. Whereas here, this is just saying wherever you see an A, you can replace it with an X, independent of anything else that's going on. But it might be important to look at where the context of where this A actually is in order to apply this rule in the first place. So that's what's called a context sensitive language. And so there's an equivalent notion of a context sensitive grammar. So let's talk about what a context sensitive, let's learn to spell, sensitive grammar or a CSG. So what is a context sensitive grammar? Well, you, if you want to apply a variable replaced with something else, you need to know the context around it. So all of the rules are going to have a certain form, which is going to have some form of alpha, a, uh, gamma. Actually, I'm going to replace it. I'm going to say beta here. There are different notions depending on the textbook that you use here. Um, but what we're going to have here is this is the context. So the alpha and the beta here are the context in which the A appears. And we'll say what alpha and beta can be in a sec, but that's what's around the A variable. And we don't want to change the context in which the variable occurs. It's just that we want to only be able to apply the rule in this particular context. So whatever it's replaced with, let's just call it x, we have to have alpha and beta on both sides of that too. So uh, the context, wherever this a is, we're forcing it to um, under this particular condition, you have you can change the a to an x, but only under this particular condition. So what? It, so there are different notions of what these alpha and beta are, but the most common one is where we can have them be anything. Uh, the alpha and beta can be anything. So alpha and beta uh, are anything. And we require that the x thing be non-empty. Okay, there's a, a whole technical reason why that's the case, but you can have alpha and beta be anything that you want. In fact, they can be the empty string too. So in fact, if we let alpha and beta be the empty string, then we recover the context-free grammar definition because if there's nothing on both sides, it's the same thing as nothing on both sides over here too. So every context-free language is a context-sensitive language already, uh, apart from this one peculiar thing right here, where the right-hand side has to be non-empty because of this little condition right here. So sometimes we allow ourselves to have the start variable go to the empty string, as that's the only way to make the empty string, and, and that will fix everything. So that implies, because these can be anything that you want, that implies that every context-free grammar is already a context-sensitive grammar if we allow this, which is pretty cool. So let's uh, think about, okay, well, 
If we have a context-free language, that's already a context-sensitive language. Let's, in fact, write that down. So if it's a CFL, it already is a context-sensitive language. But what about the other way? So is every context-sensitive language also a context-free language? And I'm going to show you that that is not the case. So we can actually make a context-sensitive grammar for something that is not context-free. And the prototypical language for this is A to the N, B to the N, C to the N, where uh, N is at least zero here. Okay, so here, uh, this thing is not context-free, and I've done many videos on uh, showing that this is not context-free. And what I want to show that is that you can make a context-sensitive grammar for this thing. So let's see. So how would we actually do this? Well, note that we have to have exactly the same number of A's, B's, and C's all the way through. So what do we want to do here? So what I want to do is this. So let's have a start variable make the empty string. So we, in order to handle the zero case, and, and because that's the only way we can actually get the empty string according to this definition. So then otherwise, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go to a variable S prime. So, so this guy is the start variable. So S prime is gonna handle the non-empty strings in this language. Well, what are we gonna do? Well, because the string is non-empty when we get to here, when we wanna make it, we, and there are many ways that you can actually approach this, but uh, if it's non-empty, then, then obviously there's at least one C in the string. Um, if we have a non-empty string in this language, we must have one C at least. So whatever this thing is, whatever it generates, it has to have a C at the end, no matter what uh, happens before that. Well, let's see, what can we do? Well, we could have exactly one of the three characters. So exactly one A, exactly one B, exactly one C. So let's think about how that would work. So clearly I can, I can just put A, B, C like that. But that's not going to help us a whole lot because um, uh, it, I can't insert any, um, uh, uh, sorry, according to the rules of a context sensitive grammar, we have to have a variable in order to replace it with stuff. And this thing doesn't have a variable to replace it with. So what we're going to do here is we're going to have an A right there. And then the A variable is going to make just a single A. So in effect, I've done exactly the same thing, but this allows us to do more because this inserts for us some context in order to have the A, B replaced with other stuff. Because, um, well, there's nothing over here, which is allowed, but we have a B and potentially the C over here to replace it with. Okay, so what are we gonna do here? Well, uh, what I wanna do is let's think about um, can we do something like this repeated? So what I kind of want to have is something along the lines of a whole bunch of A's variables, a whole bunch of B's, a whole bunch of C's as variables. But this is equivalent to the original problem, obviously, because then I can just convert the A's, the capital A's to little A's, capital B's to little B's, capital C's to little C's, and we're back where we started. But what I'm going to do is not this, but I'm gonna do something very similar, which is to have um, A, B, A, B, A, B, etc. And then we have a whole bunch of, let's just say this ends with capital A, little, capital B. And then I'm gonna have a whole bunch of little C's at the end, okay? So then why is this going to be a good idea? Well, what we're gonna do is we're gonna allow ourselves to swap the B A's around. So the capital B, capital A, I'm gonna allow ourselves to swap those. And so when we swap these, it's gonna be capital A, capital A, capital B, B. And then we're gonna have a, a B A right here. And so we're gonna allow ourselves to swap those and then swap the A further up if we wanted to. And then just keep going all the way through. And so that's exactly what this is gonna do. So uh, one other rule for the S prime variable is to allow ourselves to have this AB pattern. So what I'm gonna allow ourselves to do is I'm gonna have 
A, B, S prime C. So what this is effect going to do is it's going to make one C at the end for every occurrence of A and B, capital A, capital B, and then we're just going to recursively do that. So effectively, the number of C's that I'm going to have here is equal to the number of capital A, capital B's. The only problem now is that the capital A, capital B's are in the wrong order, where I need to have the capital A's at the front and the capital B's at the end. So how are we going to fix that? Well, uh, we can't just do a straight swap. We're going to have to do a, a number of swaps in the, in the middle. So. Uh, what I'm going to do in pink is the, the swapping part. So here we're going to say, okay, we got to we got to eventually turn the BA into a AB. That's what we eventually want. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, swap them a little bit at a time. Okay. Uh, because we can't just swap two variables at once. Be, be, according to the definition. We can only uh, ha replace one variable with other stuff. The a alpha and beta here can be terminals or variables if you wanted to. And in fact, we're going to use that here. So here, I'm going to allow ourselves to replace BA with capital CA. CA, I'm going to allow ourselves to replace with CB. And then finally, CB is going to be replaced with AB. So I, if I wanted to, if I allowed ourselves in the definition, I can just say BA gets replaced with AB. Um, the problem with that is uh, that we can't replace two variables at once. So we, we need to replace one at a time. So here, the con I'm going to highlight the context. So the context is nothing on the left side of B and then the A. So then that's the context. It's the same context on both sides. It's just replacing this B with a C. Then the context here is replacing the A with the capital B. So the context in the second rule is the capital C with nothing on the right side. And then still C, nothing on the right side. And then the context for the final one is the B with nothing on the left side. Nothing on the left side. And then the right side is the context. Okay. So now we need to uh, replace the B's with sorry, the capital B's with little b's. So then what we're going to do here is, well, um, if we're not in this rule right here, which will take care of that one b, we must have at least two b's in the string. So then what I'm going to allow ourselves to do is to replace b, capital B, little b, with one more b. So uh, there must be at least two b's. And so therefore, wherever this this b capital b has to be next to a little b um, because if we allow ourselves just to replace the, the capital b with a little b then we could break out early over here and have b's in the wrong place so the capital b has to be adjacent to an existing lowercase b in order for the b's to be next to each other okay so that's a quick and formal proof informal <laughs> proof that this language is not a context-free language, but is a context-sensitive language. So hopefully that was interesting. Leave thoughts about context-sensitive languages down in the comments down below. As always, please like the video and subscribe to the channel. It really helps us out. There are many other links in the video description if you want to support the channel further. And as always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.